Hello everyone! Welcome back to Methods of Agricultural Research. This is Lecture 4. But before I proceed, I'd like to share with you a bit of backstory first. So early this week, I actually attempted to do a lecture of this topic on Google Meet. And we found out that it was not very successful because we experienced several technical difficulties both on my part and on the part of the students well some students so we decided after that that we are going to go back to either doing recorded lectures or self-learning kits as our primary form of learning delivery and that's why you're back to a recorded lecture so with that cleared out on this slide i am reminding you of two major classifications of research and that would be qualitative and quantitative research okay most of the alumni or alums of the department had done experimental research which can be pegged under quantitative research but a few alumni had also done qualitative research in the form of survey studies and several other students had done both a mix of quality and quantitative so I am emphasizing that because in your SLK number two, in lecture three, and in your assignment for SLK number two, you have learned that there are actually several types of research. And that alone, knowing that alone should be very empowering on your part. That when you start thinking of possible thesis areas or topics as your final requirement for graduation, you actually have so many possible choices so i would like to really have that emphasized again before we proceed to the next slide therefore it is very timely to remind you that our chosen field of discipline which is agriculture is actually a very huge umbrella of applied life sciences what I meant by that is, in your first two years in the university, you've actually taken many life sciences subjects like biology, chemistry, ecology, and many others. And from these subjects, you've learned so many fundamental concepts and theories and laws or principles that are just waiting for you to be tweaked on or applied when you come to major in agriculture. And that is indeed a very rich minefield of possibilities for thesis work. For example, you may ask yourself, what is the usefulness of the long lectures on photosynthesis to agriculture students, especially to crop science majors and to what we do in food crop production? Well, the answer should be very simple maximizing or optimizing the process of photosynthesis in our crops could lead to better yields and both plants and the farmers or crop growers would benefit when we find a way to optimize the process of photosynthesis so if you look at the graphics on the screen carbon dioxide is one of the raw materials as well as water so in our planet there's a lot of carbon dioxide it is not a limiting factor but water can be very limiting in some parts of the world in some parts of the philippines some areas are droughted but some areas are also flooded or waterlogged so there is a need for us to learn as much as we can on how to balance this equation or optimize this equation properly so we can optimize crop yields and with the changing climate, understanding further and tweaking further, uh, the process of photosynthesis becomes a good area to think of when it comes to research. So, by the way, I'm just very curious, who among you are tree huggers? I am a tree hugger and I am not ashamed to say that or admit that in public. So when i do hug a tree i actually say thank you and 
um, you may think of me as a crazy person, but well, it is not crazy to thank a tree who can do so many things that I cannot do or that people cannot do. Produce oxygen, which is a basic need for us to survive, that is something we cannot do. Um, so, I really challenge you. So, there in, in social media, there are so many challenges being posted now. I am challenging you to at least hug a tree within the month. Or every month, try to hug a tree and say some words of thank you, even if you find it kind of cheesy to do. So, yep, that's an um, example of a very theoretical concept that we apply in agriculture. This is ERI, or the International Rice Research Institute. It is one of the 14 or 15 International Agricultural Research Centers, or EARCs, scattered all over the world. And it is found inside or attached to the UPLB campus. So UP students, UPLB students, have access to some of the research facilities of ERI, and that really is very beneficial for them to also come up with very high level of thesis studies. Now, in 2012 to 2017, CMU, our college, used to send some agriculture students and some BS biology majors to ERI for a summer internship. And they usually are exposed to many of the programs research programs of ERI and many of their research facilities. So if you have visited ERI, um, you would find that it is a huge research campus. And if not, then that is really something to look forward to. So it has a lot of state-of-the-art facilities and it is one of the best places to go to if any one of you wants to be well-trained in research and wants to be a scientist. And I really hope that every one of you would be able to visit Erie sometime soon. Okay? Now, because it is a research institute, I hope you are thinking, what kind of research does it do? And that's a very solid question to ask. What kind of research does it do? Actually, because it's a very huge research campus, it has a very strong research culture. There are so many visiting uh, foreign scientists and all of them, of course, are centered to research on rice and related topics on rice. And it would be very interesting to know and to learn what kind of research they do. So let's learn more about it in the next slide. In order to learn what kind of research ERI does, it is important for us to know their mission. So ERI's mission, it is dedicated to abolishing poverty and hunger among people and populations that depend on rice-based agri-food systems. And through their work and partnerships, they aim to improve the health and welfare of rice farmers and consumers, promote environmental sustainability in a world challenged by climate change, and support the empowerment of women and the youth in the rice industry. So this mission is so noble, I think, and so commendable. And if we try to assess this or analyze this, Iris mission is actually grounded on at least five SDGs. So one, two, three, five, and 13. I hope you still remember the SDGs. So please try to go back and review on the SDGs that we have covered on the first lecture. Now with that, this is their statement. The kind of research that they do is for development, okay? okay let me just read that. Our research for development is characterized by its collaborative nature. From alliances with advanced research institutes, through strong collaborations and capacity development with governments and national agricultural research and extension systems, to partnerships with the development sector and our ability to broker novel delivery channels through the private sector. Iris' work is supported by 
a diverse network of investors aligned to common goals. So from this slide, we can glean that they can do basic research, they can do experiments, they can do many different types of research that are grounded on several SDGs and they're hoping that every research endeavor would contribute to development and largely they are looking into collaborative research um, in partnership with many different agencies. I think they believe that um, well with a lot of pairs of hands many things can be done and many problems can be solved better. So with this second paragraph we know that Erie is also subsisting on SDG number 17 which is really on partnership for the goals and that is to achieve the 16 other goals for sustainable development so that is really very commendable and that is the kind of thinking that I'd like you to have that whenever you think of a possible research topic okay then you try to find an anchor and find a way that whenever you pursue your research idea it would really contribute to something no matter how little your contribution would be but even a little contribution can also be significant now this is phil rice or the philippine rice research institute this is our domestic counterpart for iri and many other asian countries whose economies are largely based on rice as one of their major staple crops then they also have a domestic counterpart for iri now this is their central experiment station which is based in munoz nueva ecija and you would notice that it was established in 1985 which meant that 25 years after iri was established the philippine government decided to also establish fill rice but it took them 25 years to do that now in cmu we have also a fill rice station but it is basically for production purposes whereas the one in nueva ecija is their central research hub okay that's why it's called central experiment station and i have actually sent two of my thesis students to fill rice to do their molecular experiments because we still don't have a very functional molecular lab in campus. So Sandy Jan Labarosa, who was my undergraduate thesis advisee, went there to do genotyping for Arizo Rufi Pogon. And one of the scientists of Phil Rice was our collaborator for that research um, interest. And recently, I have sent uh, my MS plant breeding student, Kim Lee Domingo, to work under the tutelage of Dr. Ruel Soralta, who is a scientist and still based at Phil Rice. And we signed actually recently a memorandum of agreement for partnership to train research students. And hopefully some of you would be able to visit Phil Rice and do some of your experiments there when it is not when it will be safer for everybody to travel and to stay there. So that's the story of Phil Rice. Now, Phil Rice's mandate is to develop high yielding and cost efficient technologies for Filipino rice farmers. So they have a very simple statement about their mandate, but everything they do, so it's also a, a huge research station. So they have a lot of divisions. Definitely they have the plant breeding division, they have the soil science division. They have even the development communication division. Phil Rice is like an entire college of agriculture and many other related disciplines. And just like Erie, but on a smaller or domestic scale. Let's continue then to learn more about research problems. And this time we focus on problem statements. Um, in your lecture three, you learned about the characteristics of research problems and of research objectives. And this time, we're going to learn more about how to write problem statements. But before that, 
just a bit of review. When we talk about research problems, they are written in interrogative form and research objectives are written in declarative form. So it's some kind of very firm statements on what will be done. Okay. So the research objectives would try to address the research problems. I think you know that already. So let's have an example. So this is a problem statement on Arisa Rufi Pogon. And I have a footnote there that Arisa Rufi Pogon is one of the wild Arisa species under the genus Arisa, of course. And I think there would be around 24 wild Arisa species and two cultivated ones. So the first cultivated Arisa is Arisa sativa, which is Asian rice. And the second is Arisa glabarima, which is African rice. Although lately, even Africans would prefer the taste of the Asian rice. Now, what is very interesting about Arisa rufi pogon, or what we have nicknamed eventually as rufi, is that in the Philippines, although it can be found in other countries as well, Rufi is only found in Bukidnon, so far based on records. And it is found in Lake Apo in Ginoyoran, Valencia City, and in Lake Napalit in Barangay Pigtaoran and Pangantukan. So we hold the record of hosting the natural populations of Rufi Pogon. So the problem statement is for a survey experimental research, and it states, the primary problem of the study is to assess the genetic diversity of natural populations of O. Rufi Pogon found in two lakes in Bukidnon. And specifically, it will try to answer the following questions. I think there are five listed. So the first question is, what is the magnitude of phenotypic diversity for qualitative and quantitative traits of Rufi Pogon at each lake? Um, that question means that the researcher is interested to know how much diversity is there. So if you are pursuing plant breeding, definitely one of our interests should be to always know how much available genetic diversity there is that can be used for breeding programs. And so if we consider Rufi Pogon, which is a potential source of genes in order to further improve our Arisa sativa, then yeah, we are definitely concerned about how much diversity or genetic variation would be available. The second question is, which natural population of Rufi Pogon has higher phenotypic diversity? Okay, is it in Lake Apo or Lake Napalit? The third question is, what environmental factors may contribute to its variation? We know for a fact that genetics or genes can be influenced by environmental factors and especially now with the changing climate it would be really interesting to re-evaluate uh, the natural populations of, of Orizer Rufi Pogon in both lakes. The fourth question is will phenotypic diversity of Rufi Pogon be validated by SSR markers? Now I hope that in your basic genetics you have cover the topic on molecular markers. So SSR stands for simple sequence repeats and they are unique sequences in the DNA and that's why we call them molecular markers. On the other hand, if we go to the qualitative and quantitative traits, these are phenotypic markers, things that we can see, things that we can measure or categorize or characterize. The fifth question is based on SSR genotyping, Will the two populations of Rufi Pogon be distinct? Okay, so this research would actually do two experiments, and that is on phenotypic assessment and um, genotypic assessment. So, if you remember your basic definitions of what the phenotype is, this would be the physical appearances of genes or traits, and then genotypic or genotype would be the genetic composition. So, it could be the allelic composite or the genetic composition of those traits. So this is a dual experiment study, um, field experiment and a molecular experiment. So similar to what um, Sandy John Labarosa had done. And so whenever you come back to campus in the future and next year, I hope you would find time to read his thesis. Okay, so.
The previous slide gave you examples of research problem statements that are written in interrogative form. And for this particular slide, we are going to give examples on research objectives that are written in declarative form. So going back to the same example shown earlier, these are now the research objectives. So first is to estimate the magnitude of phenotypic diversity for qualitative and quantitative traits of orufipogon present at each lake. The second is to compare the phenotypic variation of rufipogon at each lake. Third is to identify which ecological, physical, anthropogenic factors may influence or affect the magnitude of diversity of this wild rice at each lake. Fourth is to determine the genotypic diverse rufipogon populations at both lakes using SSRs. And lastly, to compare the genotypic variation of rufipogon based on SSR markers. So these are examples of research objectives that are written in declarative form. And each objectively addresses the exact research problem statement that was given in the previous slide. So you can go back to this video, to this lecture, and study further and learn more. After the research problems and the research objectives statements, we now come to hypotheses. So hypothesis is the plural word for hypothesis, which is an educated guess, a temporary educated explanation proposed as answer to a research problem based on prior statement. Remember that a research problem is written in interrogative form and normally we try to give an answer. Now what is good about a hypothesis is that it's not just a out of the blue answer. We really do deep, deep thinking and try to present an educated guess based on the background knowledge that we have, based on our stocks of knowledge of our basic sciences and many other related sciences. So a hypothesis also guides the researcher to design the research process or procedure to do in order to prove or disprove the proposed answer. So definitely, when there is a research problem, and especially if it's written in question form, we have answers, we try to propose an answer, and that is the hypothesis or hypotheses if we have several possible answers. And we need to think how we can arrive at a conclusion to accept or deny or reject our proposed answers. A hypothesis also provides the clarity for any researcher on what to do and how to go about solving this research problem. So it gives him ideas or gives her ideas on the details of what he or she is going to do and how he or she is going to go about reaching the final end, final end, <laughs> that is to prove or disprove his or her hypothesis. Now, there are two types of hypotheses. You know this by heart. The first is null hypothesis. Um, normally, what we say is that when we have different treatments, then there would be no differences among the treatments. When we study the independent variable and the dependent variable, the null hypothesis actually means that there are no meaningful relationships at all between the independent variable and the dependent variable. So that is the hypothesis, a negative statement. But the alternative hypothesis, and if we write it this way, it's like mu not equal to zero, at least one of the variables would be different. At least there would be something significant between the independent variable and the dependent variable. And that is what we did to confirm and understand and explain. And that's the reason why we would dis design a particular research process in order to arrive at a final answer. Let's have more examples of null hypothesis. 
although this may not be very related to crop science or agriculture but nonetheless these are good examples but let's be reminded again that a null hypothesis assumes that there is no relationship between two variables and that controlling one of the variables has no effect at all on the other variable so this is the first example age has no effect on musical ability so maybe the question or the research problem was would people of different ages show difference in their musical ability and so that's the null hypothesis there's no difference at all both young and old would have comparable musical ability the second is this oh now this is related to crop science plant growth is not affected by light color okay plant growth is not affected by light color hmm that's interesting now the third null hypothesis example is related to animal science cats show no preference for food based on shape so you can see that one bowl would have a different shape and the other bowl would have a different shape and so maybe the question was would cat prefer a particular shape of food and the null hypothesis says no not not really cats would show no preference to food if it's only based on shape. so these are examples of null hypotheses now i think this is an extension of the previous slide so this is from helmenstein 2019 and you can see the website address if you'd like to check it out so this is actually the research question are teens better at math than adults and the null hypothesis is age has no effect on mathematical ability second does taking aspirin every day reduce the chance of having a heart attack and the null hypothesis is taking aspirin daily does not affect heart attack risk third do teens use cell phones to access the internet more than adults and the null hypothesis is age has no effect on how cell phones are used for internet access which means that both old and young have the same kind of usage for internet access do cats care about the color of their food well cats express no food preference based on color or based on shape as in the previous slide does chewing willow bark relieve pain so the null hypothesis is there is no difference in pain relief after chewing willow bark versus taking a placebo so again this would be examples that you can go back to if you'd like to really practice more on writing your research problems your research objectives and your research hypotheses now we come to theoretical and conceptual framework so after hypothesis this is now the thing that we need to understand also so what are these a framework is a clear explanation on the relationships of variables being evaluated and when you do research you choose only one whether you are going to prepare a theoretical framework or a conceptual framework and most students may find it easier to prepare uh, the conceptual framework but some others may also prefer the theoretical framework although normally this is really not a very compulsory requirement for Aggie students at least among crop science people but it really helps if you know how to do this but I know uh, that other senior students in other disciplines and other colleges are required to prepare a framework so a theoretical framework shapes the justification of the research problem or the objectives in order to provide the basis for defining its parameters okay the factors that are there and what would be the variables you're going to consider uh, for measurement and just for study basically so because it's a theoretical framework it means that you deal about theories and principles and concepts and central ideas or even dogmas so you have key concepts that are identified relevant to your research problem or objectives 
It is a symbolic construction which uses abstract concepts, facts, principles, variables, and the relations that explain and predict how an observed phenomenon exists and operates. Maybe this is very wordy for you right now, but once we reach examples, once we reach the examples, then it may be more clear to you. On the other hand, conceptual framework presents specific and well-defined concepts that are called constructs. And whenever we prepare frameworks, assumptions will always be involved. Now, assumptions are presumed true statements of facts related to the research problem. So here's an example. If you remember uh, the example on Rufi Pogon, okay? Now, this is one of the assumptions. Crop breeding programs are sustained with the availability of adequate genetic variation. Adequate means there's enough genetic variation. So if you do breeding, um, if there would be no di differences among your plant material so what would be your basis for you know selecting parents to cross and to produce uh, progeny that would be better than the parents okay and that is why the look out for wild relatives like oriza rufipogon we call it a wild relative of oriza sativa and its genetic diversity are potential useful materials for the breeding program of rice and that's why this is the assumption okay now this is an example of a theoretical framework although this is very very simple based on the example of rufi pogon so these are the concepts on top you have three major concepts first uh, wild species or relatives of cultivated crops are good reservoir all valuable genes for resistance to biotic and or abiotic stresses and that's the reason why many plant breeding programs are always interested with wild species or wild relatives of the cultivated crops the second concept is wild species continue to evolve in their natural habitats giving rise to new alleles or new genes and that is why again people are interested to study wild species because they may have new genes and new alleles that are useful for breeding programs. Another concept is variable environments, either macro or micro, and even other related factors like um, the activities of people or communities in that area, okay, contribute to the phenotypic and genotypic diversity of plant species, of course, through time, no? And this would these concepts are relevant or related to the interest on assessing the phenotypic and genotypic diversity of Rufi Pogon in Bukidnon. And you have here two boxes below, and that is you assume that there would be differences in the phenotypic and genotypic diversity of the natural populations of Rufi in Lake Apo and in Lake Napalit. And that's why this is a research of interest because you believe that they differ so this is an example of a theoretical framework so if you learn how to do this then the big picture of your proposed thesis no would be more clear and this particular framework that's why it's called a framework would give a structure to your thoughts and to a structure to your ideas and would also guide you what kind of literature materials you have to read what kind of other things that you have to research online or in the library, if you can access a library, so that you would have a clear understanding of your research problem. Now, this is an example of a conceptual framework. So it's a very basic structure. No? In the previous slide, you have very complete statements of concepts here you basically just sort of identified what are the independent variables and what would be the dependent variables it's just a conceptual framework like um, although this is not related to crypt science but um, still useful a useful example and maybe relevant because you are the digital generation and the social media generation so there are three independent variables identified by the author of this proposal so facebook marketing 
uh, discounts and appearance are all variables that would contribute to the revenue which is considered as the dependent variable so i think this is about advertising or market sales or whatever so yeah so this is the conceptual framework now we come to the significance of this study and this is very important for you to be really familiar with because everybody and everyone will be asked to explain the importance the rationality of your proposed study uh, why you are proposing your idea that research should be done on it okay it is a must in a proposal it is a must in research in thesis in dissertation and anything else uh, to be able to justify a proposal you no know, should be something that we need to be well trained of and it has to be presented clearly and comprehensively and you can only do that if your research problem is very clear in your brain and well i would always say to my students that when you do research it should be an engagement of both the mind and the heart or the brain and the heart because if you have that engagement of both your major uh, faculties then it is very easy to defend um, a proposal so the other way to say it is this is your sales pitch no so when you try to sell something and you have to convince um, the person you're selling to why the item you're selling is very valuable and it's the same thing you have an idea a thesis means actually an idea that you would like to investigate and you're going to do a sales pitch to your advisor first and when she agrees then you're going to do another round of sales pitching to your panel and before you do that then you better really learn the importance of your study so that making the sales pitch would become easier and there are two ways to present the significance of the study either in the inductive way or deductive way which means that if you choose the first one then you start with a specific scenario and then you generalize okay on the importance of your study deductive means you start with a big idea and then you try to specify it uh, on well still again on the importance of your study so inductive or deductive and you will include here the relevance or potential contribution and impact of your study to global and national goals so remember sdgs in the philippines is a signee of the sdgs and also to your local communities and to your target stakeholders or the clients that you are intending to address the problem with so again recall the sdgs and also it may be well useful to also present the roi or return return on investment either in monetary terms or in developmental terms so this is an example of a paragraph i pulled out from the article that i wanted you to read for lla number three so well it's a long read but i'm just sort of pointing out to you that for this particular section that is one of the justifications of the authors why they did this particular study so this is already a journal article which means that it's already done the research had been done and this was part of their justification so i think this was on yeah passiflora on passion fruit and they said therefore the opportunity to identify species of passiflora with sour passion fruit off-season production in order to add this characteristic to commercial passion fruit trees breeding programs to start as well as continue wild species breeding programs is real well maybe there's a different way to state this or to write this in, in a clearer way but this is one of their justification why their study was done now we come to the scope and limitations of the study i think we're now on the last part 
So every study cannot really cover everything. There would always be limitations and therefore you have to make it clear um, what are the boundaries of your study? What would be the scope and what are the limitations? What are the things that you can only do? Okay, so it is an important section in a research proposal or report. It includes, so when you establish the scope and limitations, you try to state um, what would be the coverage of the area. So for crop science people, especially for agronomy, well, even plant breeding majors and horticulture majors and other majors related to plant research, we try to indicate the area coverage that we can only do. Okay, so for example, I do this research only under Muswan conditions. So whatever um, data and conclusions you will make, it would only be, this would only be applicable to Muswan area. So you have to state clearly what are your subjects, what are the research apparatus, equipments, instruments, other things that you would use. That is why if you would look at um, an example of a thesis manuscript, Normally, if you read through the methodology or the materials and methods section, some students would really specify what is the model of a particular equipment that they used because uh, there could be differences in results and you are being told that these are my results because I use this particular equipment or apparatus, okay? And other research issues, for example, you had a problem on um, water availability. So that will be stated that you will be conducting this particular research during the drier months and perhaps the findings of your research may be a bit different from a normal season where there would be abundance of water. So things like that. Now in crop science, especially for field experiments, what we do is state the location. I think I, I said that already and the duration of conduct are explicitly stated like the field experiment was will be done from September 2020 to February of 2021 so that um, readers and the, your readers and your whoever would be interested to read up on your thesis and on your report would know that your findings would be sort of limited to the conditions during the conduct of your study in those months and in that particular location okay so why because we can only provide often we can only provide fixed conclusions so what we mean is that we cannot generalize that is why there is a difference between conclusions and generalizations so often what we can only provide would be conclusions and our conclusions based on our, based on our research findings are only good for our location and for the duration of um, our research because generalization would be like it's like um, a finding that applies to all which may not be really true okay so be careful about conclusions and generalizations I think I said that already. You cannot gen generalize things unless um, for crop science research, uh, we can only generalize sort of when we have validated our results and findings by multi-location experiments in at least two cropping seasons. So cropping season means that they differ in environmental conditions also aside from physical location. So um, if we still have wet and dry seasons in the Philippines, then yeah, one wet season, one dry season. Although Technically, it's very difficult to identify which is a dry season and which is a wet season. That's why we opted now to indicate the months by which you did your field trial um, or whatever research you do, you indicated the duration or the month, specific months that you have conducted that particular experiment. Now, it is also important to have definition of terms. Okay, and there's an asterisk there and I will explain later on. So there are two types of definitions, um, what we call conceptual definition and what we call um, operational definition. So I already gave you an example, so I'll go back to the conceptual definition first. So a conceptual definition is usually, you know, what's provided by dictionaries 
and well based on concepts so for example how do we define seed what is the conceptual definition of seed a seed is a ripened ovule composed of the embryo and stored food or you can say a seed is composed of three parts a seed goat or a seed cover uh, embryo and then a tissue that would be stored food but when we talk about operational definition and you have to really do this so that everybody would be on the same page operational means how did you use this word in your research so operational definition means that it's on how you use these terms in your study so for example if you're working on let's say cassava or sugarcane now these plants or these crops are not usually grown using their seeds but you can define that a seed is any material used for planting whether seeds or vegetative parts of plants so these are what we mean by conceptual definition and operational definition oh that was the last formal slide and this would be the end of the chapter on research problem and research objectives so please make sure that you go through again if ever some areas are not very clear um, to you then please ask me during our google meet and clarify or you don't have to wait for our google meet schedule you can already post your questions in our google classroom okay and again i think i've made a habit of doing it before i end the lecture i'm going to leave you with some very um words very words <laughs> um words that are full of wisdom that's relevant to our subject and then now this comes from Z zora hurston research is formalized curiosity it is poking and prying with purpose let me say that again research is formalized curiosity it is poking and prying with a purpose so it's like dissecting an entire idea because we want to achieve something and definitely what we want to achieve is answer our research questions and declare that we have achieved or completed the process of answering um, every objective okay and with that, I'm going to say bye and see you in the next lecture.